ladies welcome to she she owns she builds she invests and she is me she is you she's all of us so thank you so much for being here with us thank you for adjusting your schedules uh it's gonna be worth it so just buckle up uh as you know we are on a mission to help one million women create generational wealth through real estate so welcome and thank you for being part of that. Uh, just let you know, we are live on Facebook. We would love to see your smiles. Turn on your cameras. Uh, disclaimer, uh, all the speakers that we bring offer products or services and we do not endorse any of them. We invite them because we have done something with them. We believe in them, but we do not endorse anything. Uh, just like any investment, all the investments that we offer, uh, there is risk. Uh, so do your due diligence before doing anything. Talk to your CPAs. We are not financial advisors. All right, uh, a little bit about Massive Capital. We are a vertically integrated company. We do multifamily. We have over 2,000 units across Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, and Denver. We also have a sister company that does new construction for triple net um, projects. We have an in-house construction company. We have a triple net property management company. We have a triple net brokerage. And uh, we have, of course, uh, equity where we bring women like do like you, uh, just retail investors, just like you and I, but we also have family offices. Uh, and we are actually in the works of launching our first fund. So stay tuned for that. We are super excited. Um, but here was my favorite slide that we just added. How do you get benefit uh, from investing in real estate? So first of all, it has cash flow. Either if you're looking to uh, get and retire, uh, just uh, there is a stat that women die alone. So you need to be retired. Uh, if, uh, if your husband dies, you need cash flow. Or if you want to do something else, travel the world, you know, have kids or, you know, focus on your business. The, having a, an, another stream of income is very helpful. The second, long-term appreciation, especially when we when we have retirement accounts, it's very um, helpful to put your money because uh, you're gonna get all the appreciation from these uh, commercial properties. Leverage, you get the benefit to pretty much invest passively. We do all the heavy lifting. Uh, we have a whole company, finance, property management, everybody doing, making sure uh, we have great returns to our investors. Uh, and you focus on growing your business, building your career, or just doing whatever you want. So you leverage that uh, diversification. It's good. Not we all, all we hear this all the time. We need to put we you cannot put all the eggs in one basket. So just having different properties, different uh investments is always good. Uh one of the favorites is the tax benefits that you get at the end of the year, uh, through the as accelerated the depreci depreciation. If you are exiting a, a business or having a settlement from insurance, um, you're gonna pay a lot of taxes at the end of the year. So investing in real estate is very, very uh, profitable and it will help you offset some taxes. Of course, every person needs to talk to their CPA. Uh, but yeah, those are some of our uh, benefits of investing in commercial real estate. Stay connected with us. Uh, I'm gonna pass it on to you, Maria. Please introduce us to our powerhouse today. Thank you so much, Jasmine. I'm excited to introduce our amazing speaker. If you don't know who she is, her name is Miss Mina Jetty. She is the founder of Vive Funds. She's a unique commercial real estate firm that specializes in curating conservative opportunities for investors. 
don't know why my video stopped, but we're okay. Uh, she brings a dynamic pers perspective to targeting, acquiring, managing, and operating assets using the best practices combined with cutting edge technologies. Her professional experience includes driving corporate strategies and business development opportunities. After graduating from the University of Illinois at Chicago with a degree in finance at 20 years old, she pursued her passion for real estate. Mina has over a decade of real estate experience and over 1 billion, I'm gonna say that one more time for the people in the back, 1 billion in real estate assets over her career in both the startup and corporate worlds. Because of her diverse background, she is often a panelist and speaker for various podcasts, global conferences, and radio shows. Aside from her professional endeavors, Vina is a passionate philanthropist and has founded and served on the board of a national nonprofit organization in 2017 and and served on the board of a national nonprofit organization. She was one of only three women to receive the Political Women of the Year Award for the significant amount of time she has spent focused on aiding the grassroots Hurricane Harvey disaster response. She continues to be involved in helping companies and charitable organizations to, do, to better develop disaster recovery protocols for future emergencies. We are so excited to have you, Ms. Pina Chetty. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for being here today. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Goodness. Thank you, Vina. Uh, so let's get into uh, the first part that Maria said. So you got your finance degree at 20. How, yes. tell us about the transition that you made to getting real estate. Yeah, so I actually come from a real estate family. My mom is a very successful real estate investor, but she only invested in single family homes. She never had multifamily in her portfolio until I started doing multifamily. So I was the first in my family to buy multifamily assets. And like you said, I graduated when I was 20 years old with my degree in finance. And I thought that I was going to go out into the world and do something really great and something revolutionary because my mom had wanted me to come and work in the family business. And I was like, I'm an adult with a degree. And then I went and worked at some of the biggest real estate companies in the entire world. I left Tishman Spire in 2012. They owned, at that time, they owned the Chrysler Building and Rockefeller Center still in New York. So they had some pretty notable landmark buildings, trophy buildings. Uh, but I was making a lot of money for somebody else. And my husband and I were both paying a significant amount of taxes because we were both W-2s. And so our first year married, we paid about $200,000 in taxes, which at that time was almost like 50%, 45% of our total income. And I called my mom and I was like, mom, can you believe this just happened? And she's like, okay, quit your job. And I was like, what? Let me just quit my job. Okay. So I uh, talked to my husband. I quit my job, started investing, bought single family homes, um, hated it because it was so much work and energy and effort. And I really wasn't making that much money and then decided I needed to figure out how to scale up quicker. And that's where I started investing in multifamily. And now um, last year, I actually just broke the billion dollar mark in our portfolio. So very excited about that. Thank you. Ooh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's so exciting. And I know like you don't have a crystal ball, but when your mom said to just, you know, stop and go a different way, how do you like foresee these trends going? And was that hard for you to do when you had to kind of go a different way? Did you know what was going on? Were you looking at trends? Like, how were you preparing for, for that change in your, in your business? You know, at that time I was like 26 years old. So this was 12 years ago. Um, I was a lot younger and a lot dumber back then too. Um, so I don't think I actually gave it the foresight that it probably deserved. I just dove right in with, jumped in with both feet and like, you know, it, a lot of the decisions I make even today are risk mitigated decisions. And what I mean by that is 
I'm not usually planning for like what the possibilities are or what the outcome is. I'm really looking at what's the worst case scenario and can I survive or pivot from that? It's very, very rare that the answer is no, you can't survive or come back from that. And the younger you are, the more aggressive you can be in your decision making because you have time on your side. Time is so much more valuable than any amount of money ever, period. So at that time, my mentality was, okay, if it doesn't work, I'll just get another job. I have marketable skills. I can always go back into the workforce. Uh, spoiler alert, it worked. Um, so looking forward, right? This is a really interesting time in our market because we are seeing cap rates increasing, interest rates expanding, low supply, home single family home supply, and we're seeing a lot of rate caps expiring from when people bought in the last two, three, five years with bridge debt. And so it's creating this perfect storm in multifamily specifically that I actually think this is going to be probably the best opportunity that we're ever going to see in our lifetimes in multifamily. Here's why. One, people cannot afford to buy houses anymore. They just can't. Inflation is too high. Interest rates are too high. There's not enough supply. And in the areas where population is still growing, it is becoming astronomically expensive. To buy, An average home price is about $400,000 in this country. To even qualify for a $400,000 loan, forget if you have the $80,000 in down payment you need, you have to make at least $120,000 a year just to qualify, okay? Now, the reality is at $120,000 a year, you might qualify for the loan if your only debt is your mortgage, but most Americans carry debt. Most apparent, uh, Americans don't have any kind of savings, right? Most Americans are one flat tire away from complete financial ruin and devastation. And then you couple that with what's happening with the multifamily market, which means like we're seeing a 52% increased expense if you're trying to buy your house versus renting it. So we're seeing a heavier or a better qualified tenant base than we've seen in a long time, even though national rents are generally softening. So with all of that being said, here's what I think is going to happen. Here's what my crystal ball says. I'm just kidding. I don't have a crystal ball. So it's anybody's guess. I, I like do think pretend. I like to pretend. And I like to think that if I say it enough times, I'll manifest it to be yeah. truthful, right? Um, no, but one, I do think that the Fed is going to cut the interest rate at some point in the next six months. I do think we're going to see one, maybe two cuts. Um, I think we'll definitely see more movement at the beginning of 2025. So I think this is the time to get positioned and ready to buy multifamily if you're not already buying multifamily. And I also think that we're going to see a lot of sellers who have a little bit of a come to Jesus moment and understand what the actual price expectation is. Um, we have a lot of sellers that still want 2021 pricing and 2024 and it just doesn't really work like that. And so I think we're going to start seeing a little bit more of a reality check, especially as loans start coming due or go into further default. Um, and I do think that this is creating a very unique time if you can be on the investment or the buy side. Uh, I, I don't know what the bigger implications are going to be for just general humanity. But I do think that from the investment side, it is good for us. It's also an election year. So there's always a little bit of turbulence and shake up whenever there is an election, whether which, whichever side you're on, it doesn't actually even matter. But um, and then I think it's going to be interesting, too, to see if the Senate actually passes the bill to bring back full bonus depreciation. We thought they would before this tax year. Um, yes, they have it yet, but, uh, it did pass the house. So I do think it likely will pass the Senate. Um, that's what our indicators are saying to us, but you know, who knows? We'll see what they do. They have minds of their own. Yeah, that's really good. And actually, now that you talk about, uh, the tax benefits and actually that your mom told you quit your job. Yeah. So walk us through the tax benefits that you saw back then and you continue seeing and the cost segregation and all those tax benefits. Yeah. So um, one, I'm not a tax advisor and I have no licenses, so you shouldn't even listen to anything I'm going to say. <laughs> now, with that being said, um, <laughs> so when you have any kind of 
real property. You can depreciate the property over different spans of time, depending on whether it's commercial or residential. And then we can accelerate depreciation on commercial assets. It makes a lot of sense. You can do it on single family assets, investments, but it especially makes sense on multifamily. So what happens is um, we have a cost segregation study done where they'll send in a consultant who's an expert and they'll say, okay, Vina, the plumbing fixtures, this is this plumbing system is about $2 million for this building. And the useful life of it is five years, but you can accelerate it all to year one. I think now we're in 60% bonus depreciation for 2024. Um, this is what I was talking about earlier. The Senate is has to decide on whether they're going to bring back 100% bonus depreciation. You'll still be able to depreciate it. You just can't accelerate it. So what happens is when you have full-time real estate professional status, like I do, because all I do is real estate, I meet all of the tests and there are tests that you can Google and you can see what exactly you need to meet in order to be qualified as a full-time real estate professional. But once you get that qualification as a full-time real estate professional, what happens is my losses from real estate acti activity are no longer passive losses. They're active losses. And when it comes to the tax code, likes offsets like. So if you have passive losses, you can offset passive income. Now that I'm a full-time real estate professional, all of my losses now become active losses and all of my income and my husband, who's a physician, his income, all of our income is now active income and we have active losses on the tax side that we're offsetting. And so basically we are hundred percent tax efficient, meaning we haven't had to pay taxes in years because of our write-offs through our investments in properties. So it's very much legal. And if you're not taking advantage of this, you should be talking to a tax professional who can help you get set up and structured correctly. Yes, that's one of the reasons why we love this kind of investments. And actually, we're going to have a CPA. So keep an eye out um, that you can listen to. Just like Vina said, we're not CPA. So we're just going to bring you a CPA that can answer all your questions. And I'm going to switch gears a little bit, Vina, because I didn't know, but you are a board member of a nonprofit. So talk us about your philanthropy and how do you... Um, just connect that with your passion, with real estate. Why do you do that? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I we do a lot of philanthropy. This is really important to me. Uh, my mom has always instilled this in us. And so it's something that I try to do with my girls. I have twin daughters. They just turned five on Thursday. Um, and they're five going on 25. But uh, they are five years old for age purposes alone. And so I want to instill in them to give back to others and to help other people because we have so much, right? We live in abundance and I want them to know that a lot of this is hard work and a little bit of luck sprinkled in there, right? Like I ha I've had a lot of privileges um, growing up. And so I try to instill that in them. And we do that through philanthropy. I won the uh, Politico uh, magazine, their Woman of the Year Award in 2017 for grassroots Hurricane Harvey rescue. I also, in um, a past life, I guess it was like maybe almost a decade ago now, I established a nonprofit which helped um, families that were married to physicians that were in training where you don't really make a lot of money and you live in very high cost of living areas and you have to support a family and work a hundred hours a week. So you can't like moonlight or anything. We'd help them with like angel trees and stuff like that for the holidays and like a Thanksgiving meal and stuff like that. Um, so we helped, I mean, we had 14 or 15,000 families in our community when I was doing that. Um, and now like every year for my kid's birthday, right now we're in the middle of doing a school supply drive for their birthday um, and we'll distribute those locally. I'm in Frisco, Texas, so we'll distribute them over here um, so that families who can't afford school supplies have, you know, a little bit lighter burden this year when they start school again. So yeah, we're really passionate about that. We do a lot of different grassroots efforts and a lot of different charitable do donations. Um, the Multify community, which is the community that I founded to help entrepreneurs or investors that are interested in investing in multifamily. Um, we, last year we did, we provided Christmas for 400 kids locally. 
um, just through our own network and our own multiply community. And so, you know, those are things that really light me up and they make a difference to me. I love, I love that because it's what you've oh, yeah. been able to do with your real estate and how you've been able to get, be able to give back from everything that you've gained from real estate. So it's just absolutely. And me. I'm really thankful that I have Lelaine. She's one of our multiply members. She, we, she reminded me just now we packed lunches too last year for my birthday. Uh, I made everyone come and volunteer and we packed like 350 lunches in like 30 minutes or something. They were shocked at how quickly we did it, but we were efficient too. There you go. Happy birthday. Pack a lunch. Right? There we go. Yeah. Happy birthday. Pack me a lunch for someone else. Right. There you go. I like that. I like that. So I first met you because you are a panelist, a speaker. I mean, I've seen you speaking. That's kind of where I first got to hear from you. What are some of the most valuable lessons or insights that you've gained from speaking on stages and shows that you've, because you do that a lot. Yes, I do that a lot. Um, last year, I don't even know how many, I spoke on well over a hundred stages last year. Um, you know, it's interesting. And I'll say this to this group because I think you guys will really understand it, but it's so often I go to these events and it's like all of these men on stages and I'm like, where are all the women? And they're like, well, we have you. And I'm like, yes, that's a good start, but I can name like 75 women that are qualified to be on this stage and you didn't have a single one of them. Why not? And the response I almost always get is, oh, well, they couldn't or we couldn't find someone. I'm like, no, because if you would have asked me, I would have, I keep a list of women that can speak on different topics and minorities that can speak on different topics that are good. They're qualified to speak. It's not just checking a box. Um, so that's, you know, one for me is something I've learned is, you should absolutely be voting with your dollars and you should be giving feedback to organizers. So whenever someone comes to me and says, oh my gosh, your presentation was my favorite presentation the whole day. I say, thank you so much. Please tell the organizers that because when they see women delivering and they're like, oh wait, people care about this. They're going to make different decisions because you are the product at those events, right? You are the product. So Vote with your dollars. Do not be afraid to ask where the women are, why the women aren't there. I had someone who reached out to me maybe about a month ago, and he asked if I wanted to speak in an event. And he said, would you mind sharing this with your audience? We'll give you an affiliate code, blah, 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 blah. I don't even care about affiliate codes because I would rather put good things in front of my people than break trust by just trying to make like a few hundred dollars, a thousand dollars. I don't care about that. Um, so he reaches out to me and he sends me his like flyer and everything. And I look at it and it's, there's seven people on it. Zero are women, zero are minorities. So I responded back to him and said, Oh, I really appreciate you. I'm surprised you would ask me to speak at a men's event. I don't think that really aligns with my audience. So I'm going to have to pass on this. And he responded back to me. He goes, oh, you know, don't play me like that. You know that this is not a men's event. I'm like, oh, I couldn't tell because you have no diversity or representation on your flyer. And he goes, no, no, it's for everybody. And I said, amazing. I really hope you get some quality speakers in there that represent diversity. And so I said, you know, it's just not a good fit for me at this time, but come back to me in the future if you have something, because I want to give people the opportunity to improve and do better. Right. And so, um, he, he did send me a message back. He said, you know, I just want you to know, I really thought about what you said. It's made me think a lot about what you said, and I'm going to be reconsidering this. So sometimes people just need a mirror. So that's one thing I've learned. Um, the other thing I've learned is that uh, everybody, including everyone listening to this, has an important message to share. And women, more often than men, get shamed or abused or bullied or intimidated into not speaking up and not sharing our stories. And that just has to stop. And so I think the best thing that all of us can do when there is a woman represented on a flyer or speaking at something, I know Brooke speaks at a lot of different events too. 
Um, you know, just going and making sure that we're like tagging them and cheering for them and making it known to the organizers that, hey, it makes a difference that you have so-and-so here. I'm so glad you have this person. I'm coming because of her. I think when we do that, it encourages organizers to have more diversity and representation on the stage. Um, and then also to come for the relationships you make there. Like that's really what I, I go for is because of the, I don't care about the stage time as nearly as much as the time I get to spend in the hallways, meeting people, hanging out, learning about you. I'm a people person. So for me, that totally fills my cup up. And, um, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm really lucky that I get to do this because I love what I get to do. Amazing. Yeah, we love that. Thank you so much, Bina. Uh, so ladies, start preparing your questions for Bina. Um, and I'm going to, so, okay, here's my question. What advice will you give to women who are investing or looking to start investing in real estate uh, and just taking control over their finances overall? Um, oh, sorry, guys, I got a hair in my mouth. Whatever happened to you where you were like, I just brushed my hair. Anyway. Uh, okay. What advice would I give to women? You are investors. When women get together, it is very rare that women talk about money and finances. Do you know what men do when they get together? They talk about money and finances and investments because they consider themselves investors. Women, we belong at this table. We actually should be running the boardroom because we're better investors than men. That is not my opinion, this is objectively true. If you look to Silicon Valley, this is actually the best example that we have of this. But if you, sorry guys, if you look to Silicon Valley, women do more with less funding. And if you look at women of color, that number is even less. So we are investors. We are good investors. We're great investors actually, because we do more than our male counterparts do. The same thing is true when you look at trends, right? Women control more money than men in the economy. Women are better investors. However, we start behind the eight ball, right? Because we have babies and we take time off work because that's really hard on our bodies. And we don't make the same dollar that a man does for doing the exact same equal work. And that's the nature of where it is. And obviously I don't agree with that, but that is the nature of what it is. But we need to start having those conversations. We need to stop being intimidated by them. We need to start asking those questions. And for those of us that are in positions where we're a little bit further ahead, then we need to be the ones to turn around and pull the next woman forward with us. Um, it's the only way to really do it. And then also making sure we see diversity and inclusivity at every C-suite or above decision-making or above at every company that we do business with. I fire companies if they don't have diversity in their C-suite. I don't care how great of a marketing company you are. If you don't have diversity, then you're missing working with the best. And I only want to work with the best. And that means that there will be representation at the top. So start voting with your dollars, make those hard decisions. I can't afford to support companies. I, we make a lot of angel investments. I can't afford to make angel investments or support companies that don't have diversity at the top because I'm raising two little girls. Like they deserve a seat at the table when they walk into that room. And I want them to know they belong there. If I continue to fund or support or work with or drive business toward companies that only have men in the C-suite, what kind of a message and what kind of a world am I creating for them 10, 20, 30 years down the line? So be very intentional about what you're doing, but we belong there. Just get started. It is intimidating. It is overwhelming. That's okay. Choose that discomfort over the discomfort of falling behind financially. Okay. I'm glad you said that, Vina, because it is it is hard. It's it's so hard to have that confidence. I know you talk about confidence and um, just not having the fear of stepping in and to having uh, maybe not sure what I'm trying to get at, though, of just not having the fear of just getting involved and se stepping out onto or being in, in at that table. It's hard. It's hard to do that. It's hard to have that confidence, which is why I played that song at the very beginning. We all I loved it. it. <laughs> because it is, it is hard to do that sometimes. Um, you know, moving forward to Vive Funds, what are your long term goals for Vive Funds, and how do you envision the firm evolving over the next decade? I'm all about these, these, you know, yeah. moving forward ones. 
No, this is a good question. Okay, so I'm at a very interesting crossroads of my career right now. Um, so last year we bought a deal in Phoenix, Arizona. We bought it for $131.5 million. It was the largest all woman led transaction in the entire country last year. And that was very exciting for me. Thank you. That's why it was so exciting is because it was all woman led and it was the largest all woman led transaction. That means we belong at this table, right? Um, it was also the deal that took us over the billion dollar mark, which if you stay in business long enough and you're active, then you are eventually going to cross a billion dollars. It's just a matter of time, right? So that wasn't as noteworthy or as exciting for me as it being an all woman led and the largest all woman led transaction. But I will say my goal with Vive is actually not nearly as ambitious as my goal with the Multify community. And the reason being exactly what we've been talking about, right, is there are not enough everyday people, women, minorities, differently able people, the LGBTQ community. There's so many communities that are underrepresented in private equity and especially at the scale and size of which I'm transacting. And so I really want to change that narrative and I want to help other people create generational wealth and create the lifestyle that I have for my family from what I've done. And so I'm really at a crossroads right now where I spend so much more time and energy and effort into building the community, the Multify community. So that's where most of my like focus is right now. However, with that being said, I just got awarded a deal and went under contract on it on Thursday last week. And so I'm buying another, it's uh, just under 52 million um, in the Dallas market. So I'm buying that asset. Hopefully we'll close in the next 60 days or so. Um, so I am still buying, but I don't know that I have a goal of like $10 billion or something like that. Um, I'm really looking at doing more to impact other people and change their lives and the trajectory of their lives and be accessible and be a representation of what is possible. And so, yes, I'm in Frisco, Texas. I was literally just in Denver yesterday. I flew back yesterday. I was born in Denver or Golden, Colorado. And then you graduated in Chicago. So you've been good. Oh, I've been everywhere. Yes, I've lived in seven different states, but I've been here for 10 years now, 11 years now. Okay. Awesome. Uh, I have one more question. And after that, I'm going to pass it to Kenda so she can bring up all the questions. So would you talk about building the community? Uh, so first of all, how important is for everybody to build their community, find their community? And then how, I mean, if you can give us advice on how do you grow that community? It's amazing. I see all, everybody's so active, everybody helping yes. each other. So tell us about that. Yeah. Um, okay. This is my favorite thing to talk about outside of like my family. So I could talk about this forever and ever and ever. I won't, but I can. Um the Multify community, it was really born out of a place of need. I have been in this industry for over a decade now, right? I've been in real estate investing. And when I first started, I didn't have anywhere I could go for education or any kind of real advice or mentorship. And that was a problem for me because I've spent a lot of money making a lot of mistakes. Um, I've partnered with terrible partners. I partnered. Now I have like a really great partner that I work with and my sister is my partner at Vive. So I figured that out finally, but I, I just think of it like, why does someone else have to make all these mistakes that I made? Right. And so we rolled out the multi community. Like you noticed that we're a very active community. It's really a very close knit community. And I think the reason for that, because I, I get this comment often from people who are part of multiple communities, and the comment I get the most often is, Multify is so different than any other community. And I ask them why, and it's always some variation of the same answer. And it's that our members, because we all show up the same way and we all have the same core values, it amplifies the effect of those core values and it attracts people who share those core values. So it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the core value that I think if you had to like pick one in our community, it is 
abundance. We all live in abundance and we lead with abundance and we give with abundance. And so what ends up happening is we'll have a community member who, um, like Andreas, he is actually, a, he's one of my coaches now. He mentors me. Um, he's the CEO of one of the Canon companies. You should go find him on Instagram if you're not. His name's Andreas, the CEO. And he posted in the group, he started his fund, Leapfrog Funds. And when he started Leapfrog, he needed help with his website. It was not set up correctly. And he posted saying, hey, if anyone can give me some quick feedback on the website, I'd really appreciate it. Within 30 minutes, he had 79 comments. And the comments included, here's a mistake here. Let's hop on a quick call. I can help you with A-B testing. Do you want me to help you go through and copy and copyright this and edit this? I'm really good at this other thing. And he goes, he said, the the first thing I did was ask them how much they were charging for that. And they go, no, no, no. I'm just, you're part of our community. I'm just going to help you. It's a skill set I have. And so what I found is every member shows up like that. And when every member shows up like that, then it becomes just, it takes its own life. It doesn't, it doesn't have a life that I'm breathing into. It. Everyone's breathing life into it. So it takes on a life of its own and it just creates a fire. And it's like pouring rocket fuel onto a fire when everyone shows up with that kind of abundance and everyone shows up with that kind of value that they're leading with. And so, like I said, I could talk about the Multify community forever and ever and ever and ever. So you'll just need to shut me up about it. Well, I don't want to shut you up for anything. So I'm <laughs> glad you're sharing and I'm, I'm glad you're you're telling us more about your community because those of us in the she community feel that way as well. We we want women that. to feel welcome and we come from a collaborative uh, environment. So I'm excited to hear yeah. more about that. So Thank we do you. have a couple of questions in the chat. So as we're getting closer to our uh, top of the hour, I wanted to um, just throw out a question that uh, we had earlier. Uh, the question is, with everyone trying to jump into multifamily, how important are dating your partners prior to committing to a deal? Oh, okay. This is like, uh, this is a seven figure mistake to jump directly into a deal. Don't ask me how I know, but I promise you, this is an expensive financial and emotional and mental exercise you will do if you select the wrong partners. This is, I would rather not do a deal than do a deal with terrible partners because they will not be in alignment. You will not have complete control and it can go downhill really, really, really quickly. I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, do not recommend. Um, so very important, but I would say I think more people are jumping out of multifamily than into multifamily right now, because this is now the tide is going back in and we're kind of seeing who all swimming naked. And there are a lot of people that are scrambling and getting out of the game. People that were like doing a deal every month for a while are nowhere to be found now. It's complete crickets. So I don't think that there are more people jumping into multifamily, regardless of whether it's multifamily or another business. We own a lot of other businesses. You should not get into partnership with anybody until you really know and understand who they are. And then when you find a team that works, stick with it. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you my question that I ask okay. all powerhouse entrepreneurs like yourself. And, and that is, give me your top one to five or one to three things that you look for in a partner. Integrity. That's the most important thing. I cannot add integrity to you. I can teach you things about like how I look at it, strategy, blah, blah. I can teach you all that. I cannot teach you integrity or who your character is. And I define integrity by what you do when nobody's watching, right? Integrity is not what you do when everyone's watching. It's when you do the right thing when nobody is watching. That's number one. Uh, number two is work ethic. So I want someone who is going to say, hey, I might not get it right all the time, but I'm going to keep trying until I get it. So that work ethic, that grit. Um, I have been in partnerships where my work ethic is up here and my partner's work ethic is down here. And it is it builds resentment so very quickly, so very quickly. And also when you're starting out, when you're partnering, do not go in and go, oh, okay, there's four of us. We're each going to take 25% because we're all so valuable. Don't do that. This is a mistake. Do not do it trust me on this. 
I paid for this mistake. Um, what you really need to do is you need to create all the roles and responsibilities and then assign a percentage value to that and then decide who's going to do which role and responsibility. Take the emotion out of it. Um, it's a much simpler way for you to actually get to a realistic split because when you split equally, let's say you have six partners and you each are taking, what? why did I pick six? Like the hardest math ever. What is it? 17% or something. And you each take an equal amount, right? Or let's say eight partners, you each take 12 and a half percent, right? So you each have 12 and a half percent. What happens when four partners want to do something and four don't? Yeah. It causes problems. So you definitely need to make sure that you have the same work ethic. Do not split your time or your equity equally. Do it based on actual metrics that you can measure with KPIs that you can measure. Um, I also look for someone I just like being around, but that's a stripe that comes later in business, right? Like I'm now at a point in my business where I don't have to do any of it. So if you are annoying or I don't like you or I don't want to talk to you or I dread picking up your phone call or I'm not going to take my girls around you and we're not going to do family things together, I'm just not going to work with you. I, you can eat just not at my table. Go find another table to eat at, right? And then um, I think maybe the last one is, and this is actually the one that has made my my JV partner and I so strong is we have an unwavering dedication and commitment to our LPs. Do we disagree? Yes. Do we think that we should take different paths to get somewhere? Also, yes. But at the end of the day, I know that whatever decision she's making and whatever decision I'm making, it is always with the best interest of our LPs. So ultimately it will end up being okay. And it's something I can stand behind. But when you have partners who are greedy or who care about their own financial well-being before their LPs, and they don't have that unwavering commitment to LPs, it makes it very, very challenging for you to be able to navigate that because it's just not, there's no alignment in the partnership. Yeah, that's that's some great, great nuggets and some awesome advice. Um, the last question that I have, and if you have other questions, please pop them in the chat. Um, it's just uh, when you're when you're working with whether it's LPs or a partner, tell us about a time where um, something was tough, but you made lemonade out of lemons. Oh, gosh, I have so much lemonade. I could <laughs> post a whole lemonade stand. It's unbelievable. Um, I actually right before I got on this call was um, just recording some notes for some partners of mine. Um, so we had a deal that we sold at a profit and it, for the market, it did very well. Um, but I was one of five partners on that deal and four of my partners did not want to sell this asset. And I wanted to sell this asset two years ago. It was the right time we would have made it killing. Last year, I tried to convince them. I finally got them on board, um, all for them to kind of slow play it and end up basically not working it out with the seller we had at that time. So I stepped in and, you know, I had to get a little bit more indignant, which I don't like to do, but I had to do it because our LPs were at stake here. And so we ultimately ended up exiting that asset. Now, there is a split that is going to come to the general partners, and it's a very small split. It's not much because the asset did not hit pro forma because we bought it in 2019 when it was just a different world. And had things continued the way they would have, yeah, we would have made a ton of money. We would have blown the pro forma out of the water, but that's not what happened. And so I got on a call and I advocated for our LPs that we do a hundred zero split and we take nothing as general partners. Now to my partner's point, you know, we did manage the asset. We've spent a lot of time and energy and effort. And yes, that is rightfully our money, right? Like contractually in the PPM. Yes, we are owed that money, but I think it is just such a, it's a more powerful story when we go back to our investors and say, Hey, we didn't miss pro forma. We don't have the Midas touch but we're reallocating our GP earnings to you as investors. And that's the long game. Um, unfortunately, this is what happens when you're in 
a partnership where all the partners are not in agreement. I'm the only partner that advocated for this. And so I was naturally, you know, outvoted and we haven't done it, but I have gone back and I've been communicating with investors and I've been sharing with them exactly the process, the step-by-step updates that are happening. And so, um, you know, I don't know that I've made lemonade yet, but it's definitely a challenge and we're almost on the other end of it. And I do feel really confident that we sold this asset at exactly the right time. I think if we would have waited any longer, we would have just kept losing money and um, we wouldn't have been able to exit with double digit returns to our investors. That's great. That's great. Well, are there any other questions? Did you see the one, Candice? Uh, Can you recommend a CPA who supports women who are professional real estate investors? Do you have a- Yes. Um, So we work with Larry West, Larry D. West III. He's based here in Frisco. I've been working with him for like 10 years now. Um, So he's great. I highly recommend reaching out to him. I think he's Larry D. West the third on and so his company is Precision Business Strategies. Right. And then I'm also gonna put in the chat our um uh KB tax divisors. It's two um uh women owned uh CPA firm uh in Pennsylvania, and they're gonna be talking in um up, on September 13th. They're gonna be on our, our stage. And they they specifically work um, not only with business owners, but also commercial real estate general partners. So they have a lot of great ideas on how you can not pay taxes. (laughs) And Brooke put Larry's Instagram in the chat. So perfect. Thanks, Brooke. Thank you, Brooke. I know Brooke is sick and she's still killing it in the chat. So thank you. She's amazing. Love it. Our husband, did she tell you that our husbands are like besties? Oh no. I mean, I'm not surprised because yeah. Brooke's husband's awesome, but he is. He is awesome. And it's really funny because he's like super extroverted and my husband's like super introverted. So I'm like really grateful that he's adopted my husband now. Oh good. I love that. Now, final question, Vina. Uh, I know that we kind of threw this one at you, but yes. she she builds, she owns, she invests, she's me, she's you. What does the brand she mean to you? Oh, um, wow. I have so many thoughts and I want to say all of them at the same time. That's fine. Uh, it, to me, it is the future. This is the future of everything. And I think we're in a moment of reckoning where women are really understanding and and grabbing and taking control of their future, their destiny, and stepping into the roles that they were meant to fulfill. Um, You know, we're seeing, we see trends of less and less women interested in getting married or having children or delaying both of these things until their careers are more solidified or, you know, saying like, Hey, I have a different dream. And I, I love that. And I think as women, we have to remember to be collaborative with each other and not competitive. It is a tall tale that society tells us that there's only enough room for one of us at the top. That's bullshit. And we need to help each other because this is how men have climbed to the top for many, many, many generations. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing the same. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rina. We knew this was going to be amazing. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, we you. appreciate everything and um yeah we will continue thank you so much of course you are an inspiration for us thank you. you are paving the way to all the women out there so thank you so much for that thank you for your time and we will continue supporting you on any, everything that we can so thank you so much uh for thank the you. ladies we have some events coming up uh we're gonna be in tampa uh august 20th uh, it's a Thursday for a happy hour, a networking event. Join us. Then we're gonna go in. Gonna go to Miami to attend Tenix Ladies. Uh, with Elena Cardon. She was here a couple of weeks ago. So if you wanna join that one, let us know. Um, and now let's just stay connected. If you have questions about real estate investing or any other question, feel free to book a call with us. 
people tell me like, oh no, it's your, you're so busy. I don't want to call you. And I'm like, this is what I do for work, like talking to people. So we're never too busy. Connect with any of us. Bina, she's always accessible as well. Follow her on Instagram. We're going to be sharing all her links uh, for all the ladies who couldn't make it. We changed the time. Uh, but we're going to share the recording and all the links so you can uh, follow Bina and stay tuned. She puts amazing content out there. So thank you so much, ladies. Thank you, Bina. Any last words? Thank you. No, thank you for having me. I love that you guys are doing this. This is awesome. And thank you for just allowing me to be here and to share my insights. I appreciate you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, ladies. Have a good day. Thank we'll you. We'll be in touch. Stay connected.